This is Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz on Bloomberg Radio. This week on the podcast, I have an extra special guest. Uh, I love finding these people who are just absolute rock stars within their space that most of the investing public probably is not familiar with, haven't heard about them. Maybe they're a little below the radar or institutionally facing, and so the average investor is unaware of them. You certainly are familiar with GMO, Jeremy Grantham Shop, uh, with uh, Mayo and Adolu, his, his partners. That, that shop was founded in 1977. The person who heads their focus and quality strategies is a gentleman named Tom Hancock. He also helps run some of their mutual funds and helped put together their first ETF. And he has really quite an astonishing track record. The quality fund, mutual fund that GMO runs, that's symbol GQETX, it's just crushed it over the past decade. 13.6% a year, way over both its index and its benchmark. It's in the top 1% of its peers, Morningstar, Five Star, Gold Rated, um, just really, really interesting. And Tom has helped with the introduction of GMO's first retail product, the quality ETF, stock symbol QLTY. GMO has been institutional since they launched in 1977. This is the first time they're putting out a product for retail, and Tom explains what goes into quality stock selection, why they went to the ETF. You wouldn't be surprised to learn uh, the tax consequences of owning a mutual fund is a part of it. Really fascinating guy, tremendous track record, unusual background, uh, comes from computer science and software and, and pivoted into quantitative investing. I found this conversation to be really fascinating. If you're at all interested in focused portfolios, the concept of quality as a subsector under value, uh, and just how you build a portfolio and a track record that's tough to beat. I think you'll find this conversation as fascinating as I did. With no further ado, my discussion with GMOs, Tom Hancock. Thanks, Barry. It's great to be here. So, so you have a really interesting and unusual background. Let, let, let's start there. Computer science, bachelor's from, from uh, RPI in 85, PhD in computer science from Harvard in 92. What, what was the career plan? Yeah, well, it wasn't doing investing in quality stocks in the early days, that's for sure. Um, I actually come from a very academic family. My father was a university professor. Uh, my mother worked as an editor. Her father had been a university professor. We have doctors in the family. I actually don't know that anyone in my family actually had a job at a private, <laughs> for-profit <laughs> traditional company ever. <laughs> um, I'm the first, so I'm kind of the black sheep. Um, so that's where I started from. In fact, the fact that I actually went into computer science rather than the more liberal arts discipline was a little bit non-traditional, let's say. And I think that was kind of an early wise decision that I give myself credit for is back in high school, I, you know, I was really interested in history and stuff, but I didn't really want to be a historian. So it's like, what do I actually like to do as opposed to think was interesting? And that's where um, at the time, you know, computer programming was becoming a thing. I really loved it. That led me down that track. Um, and really, while I had a software engineering job, I was always sort of pointing toward a research career. And then at some point after my PhD school uh, studies, we could get into that if you like, but I kind of decided to switch and finance was kind of what was available for me at that point. Yeah, let, let's lead up to that transition. Software engineer at IBM, then you get your PhD, then research at Siemens, which seems to be more of a technological position than a finance position. What was your focus within tech? I worked uh, the area in which I studied in, in graduate school and then worked at Siemens, which, as you say, it's a, a research lab. Think like Bell Labs, mm -hmm. IBM Watson, that kind of think tank environment. Um, I worked on machine learning, which is a subfield of, of course, artificial intelligence. So, um, Back in the 90s. Yeah, that was the 90s. So artificial intelligence is a 
it's an area that's been around for a long time. I think the term was coined in the 1950s. But I was doing it, um, or at least I should say, working on a, a small part of it um, back in the 90s. Uh, in graduate school, is at a, at a fairly theoretical way. At Siemens, it was with more applications in mind. Um, so, so how does the transition to finance take place? It seems like maybe you're going to tack into research mm-hmm. or academia. How did you How did you find your way? to both finance and GMO. Yeah, so there's two parts to that. One is just sort of why not the academic track and then the sure. why the finance part. So the, the why not the academic track was, um, in academia, I was doing very theoretical stuff that was very maybe intellectually interesting, but understood by increasingly few people in the world. So I just sort of wanted to be something that was a little more relevant. And I thought maybe the research lab would provide that. And for various reasons, it still didn't feel like that. So it was, I was basically looking for something that was relevant. I, you know, I want to be loved like everyone wants. Right? So I want to right. do something that I can talk to people about. And I don't well, you want to be loved eyes. or you want to go into finance? It's, it's one or the <laughs> um, other. Well, that, so that leads to the other with finance, which wasn't um, – certainly an opportunistic element to that. Like what kind of industry hires people that values fancy academic degrees that don't have necessarily a lot of developed specific skills and finance, I say management consulting is maybe the other thing that at least at that time was the other career trajectory, just my personality, more of a math oriented introvert finance was the natural fit. Um, For GMO particularly, I got really lucky. When I was in graduate school, so I was at Harvard. Harvard has a small computer science department. We do a lot down the river at MIT, and I went to a a research group there. It was headed by Ron Rivest, who's perhaps known to some as the R behind RSA cryptography, but he also worked in machine learning in this area. And he ran this research group of scruffy grad students and postdocs that I would go to. But there's this one guy who came from downtown who wore a suit and no one quite knew who he was. I asked, who's that guy? Like, you think he's a banker? Um, And he was a very smart guy. My uh, mental image was that he worked in the bank of back of a bank approving mortgage applications. He was really (laughs) frustrated. And this was his intellectual outlook. It turns out that was not what he he was. He was a guy named Chris Darnell, who was the start of the quantitative research effort at GMO. He was Chris, uh, Jeremy Grantham's right hand man in the in the early 80s. Uh, But he's just he also came from an academic family. He had broad interests. He came to this group. I'm not even quite sure how he found it, honestly. But in any case, when I was sort of casting around at places uh, to look, that connection was rekindled. And that was my entree into GMO. Really, really interesting. And you joined GMO in 1995. You've been there ever since. That's kind of unusual these days in finance to stay with one firm for, gee, it's almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. What makes GMO so special? What's kept you there for three decades? It's been a great place to work, obviously. I've I've thought so. I think GMO felt very familiar to me when I joined. It's a smaller firm, I think maybe 60 people at the time. It's very much of an intellectual debate, academic kind of vibe. It felt very comfortable to me. And the firm's grown, and I've kind of grown with it. I think one of the things that's kept me engaged is I've actually done different things. So kind of as we're alluding to, as you think, my background is very much on the quantitative side. Now I do fundamental side, research, portfolio management. Um, So so you joined GMO, there's 60 people, 30 years, they've grown tremendously. How big is GMO today versus when you joined? And what was that process like to experience all that growth? Yeah, I think it's about 500 people wow. today. Uh, the bulk are in Boston, which is where I sit, but we have um, investment offices in San Francisco, in London, and in, in Singapore, and Sydney, Australia. So it's a it's a global firm. Uh, the you know one of the things, sort of things when when I started at GMO, it was really just investment people almost, and ev- all the sort of compliance, client service, legal kind of. Everything was done sort of on the side by investment people, and gradually we hired, we professionalized over right. time. Um, so you've it's, become an enterprise. It's 10x yeah. what it once was in terms of headcount. It's much bigger in terms of assets, and I can tell you from personal experience, us finance people, we're not great at accounting, legal compliance all the detail or stuff that, that keeps a firm running. Yeah. The trick is we're not great, but we think we are. <laughs> so that's where we get into trouble. That, that's, that's a lot. That's really true. Um, we hear a lot about Jeremy Grantham's thoughts on markets, but much less on 
how the firm is managed, how this growth mm -hmm. came about, and the culture as a business. Tell us a little bit about GMO as, as a cultural enclave up in Boston. Yeah. Um, well, one thing to start with there is the name GMO, and it's three people, and people know Jeremy Grantham, I think, very well, but that Dick Mayo and Ike Van Otterloo are the other two. And that's relevant to your question because from the very early days before I was there, they kind of operated separate investment teams. Uh, Dick Mayo was a traditional, I'd say, portfolio, strong portfolio manager focused on U.S. stocks. Ike was similarly international stocks, and Jeremy was kind of the go everywhere, top down, big ideas guy. And that, a bit of that culture, Dick and Ike have both retired now, but a lot of that culture of different investment teams that do things a little bit differently is very much part of GMO. There is no one central view to the firm. Jeremy is a you know, very strong, powerful uh, persona um, and very deep thinker. Jeremy's never really been a portfolio manager. His mm -hmm. role has always been, in my experience at least, has always been much more of a gadfly. He makes you think about things. He makes suggestions. He pushes you to come to your own conclusion. He leads you to water. Uh, but he's not a hands on the on the portfolio person. Huh. Re really interesting. We we had him down sometime last year. Came by our offices and and spoke. And I very much get the sense he has no interest in retiring. He loves what he does. He is very plugged into everything that's going on. He He's going to do this forever, isn't he? Uh, that would be my guess. Yeah, I think he probably will outlast me in, in the industry. He's um, He is one of the smartest people I've ever met and one of the most driven people I've ever met. Uh, he has, a, I think, and hope, a long uh, professional lifespan ahead of him. I would say he is a little bit less focused on what you might call the day-to-day -day of investing at GMO, and he does a lot of stuff outside. He's very involved with the Grantham Foundation, right. his charitable organization, both on the their mission but also on the investing side of managing their portfolio. So, so that raises a really interesting question. He's a big-picture guy. He's always looking for what risks and what black swans might be coming at us that the investment community either hasn't found yet or isn't paying attention to. How do you translate that 30,000-foot view as to what's going on in the world to something like quality and focused investing? Or mm -hmm. is it really just there to sort of help you create a framework for looking at the universe. Yeah. Well, when I say he's a big picture guy, I don't necessarily mean just that he's investing is to make macro calls. I mean more that he steps back from the fray a bit and thinks about the big ideas and what really matters. And that whole idea around quality investing, that's kind of Jeremy from the 1980s, early 80s, really? and sitting back and say, hey, you know, I cut my teeth, as, as he and Dick Mayo did, on va traditional deep value investing, but we're missing something here with these higher quality companies. How should we think about that? How can we invest about that? How can we improve our process? So that sort of philosophical outside and around the box thinking is kind of what really led to us having a quality-oriented strategy and, today. And, and quality is really a subsection of value? Is that is that what you're suggesting? It's an improvement of value or a refinement on the definition of value. I mean, people use these terms loosely, of course, and these all fall under the, the rubric of fundamental investing and buying companies that are great over the long term at great prices. But the idea that you know, companies that can compound at high rates of return deserve premium multiples and you should be willing to pay for them um, is the root of it. The quality fund, ticker GQ ETX, has returned 13.6% a year over the past decade, putting it in the top 1% of its peers. So let's talk a little bit about what goes into that sort of performance. Uh, what are the core themes at GMO around focus and quality? Tell us a little bit about what differentiates GMO from the way other value investors invest. If you think about value investors, value investors traditionally are people who kind of know the price of everything and the value of nothing, right? right. They're much too focused on ratios around trailing fundamentals and not um, on the on the plus side, future growth opportunities on the negative side, maybe competitive threat. So bringing the quality idea into that, thinking about what companies have a long trajectory to grow and to grow at high return on capital, that's the key thing also, differentiating between um, – 
growth that's just sort of throwing money at the wall and seeing a little bit come back to you versus very efficient growth. That's the key to quality investing. I could maybe flip that around a little bit since I think particularly post-2008, uh, 2009, the quality style of investing has become a lot more popular. People some, Certainly something people talk a lot about. Um, the difference between our approach and a lot of quality managers is that they're really quality growth managers. So the quality, but at a reasonable price, or you could interpret that as not just chasing the companies everybody knows are high quality, but finding a few maybe more neglected names. That quality at a reasonable price is a little bit of a different style than I see most people practicing out there. So let's get into some of the definitions of this. How does GMO define quality? Yeah, so we think about quality, first off, the ability to deliver high returns on investment going forward. Then what enables that? You have to have some asset ability, capability that competitors can't equally duplicate. I mean, traditionally, it could have been like a physical asset or brand. Of course, these days in an IT world, it's much more about network effects of, uh, of platform companies and such. But you have to have that special sauce um, that's not re- reproducible. It has to be doing something that's relevant. Like you w- want to avoid the trap of companies that do one thing well, and that thing's not growing. So they just try to do other stuff. And then management quality does also come into play. Like, do you keep a strong balance sheet? Are you prudent? Do you invest when you should return capital when you shouldn't? So that's, those assets, the relevance, and then capital discipline are the key components for us. Given that definition of quality, has that evolved or changed over time, or has that been pretty much the definition going back to the 80s or 90s? That's, that's been pretty much the definition going back to the 80s and 90s. And I told you kind of the fundamental definition. There's also quantitative metrics that we look at. Um, those have evolved, but always within that, capa- that uh, cluster of high returns on investment, stability across the economic cycle are consistent, and strong balance sheets. What has changed over that period, too, is what kinds of companies best meet that threshold. So if you go back to the 80s and 90s, you really t- we're talking about like the Cokes and Procter and Gamble's right. and Johnson and Johnson. Big consumer companies. companies. Right. And big consumer and healthcare. And now it's, those are still there, but a lot more of the big tech companies, the the fang companies, more growth companies, frankly. So so for a long time it looked like Apple was a value stock, even mm-hmm. as it became big and bigger and then giant. But when we look at what people call the Magnificent Seven Are you seeing any real value there? Companies like Microsoft and NVIDIA and Netflix, I assume, are quality companies by Mm -hmm. your definition, but are they quality at a reasonable price? All the names you mentioned are quality companies. We believe uh, we don't all we don't hold all of them. It's the the prices vary. If you think about Meta and Alphabet, those are kind of the value stocks in the bin, right? Those well, they got shellacked the over the past couple of years before last year's recovery. <laughs> yeah, um, and we also hold Microsoft and and Apple. Um, Apple is actually an interesting case study because we uh, used them as an example of our investment at our investment conference 15 years ago about what a high quality company isn't. And then Steve Jobs turned around and the iPhone and so forth. And of course, right. the rest is history. Um, the point is, we were very wrong about them and we were late to the party. But the party had such long, it's such a long party that it's okay to be late to it. You see, we still had a really good time with that company, which I think is a little bit of a lesson to for quality investing. You don't have to be the first one in the door there. These th- these themes run for a long time. And if you're willing to admit you're wrong and, and change your stripes, is you can still make money. So there were a few coming. GMO, Warren Buffett were, quote unquote, late to Apple, but did exceedingly well with that. So you don't have to be at the, there at the IPO. You don't have to be there when they crash in the dot-com implosion. As long as the growth rate is there and the the value is reasonable, there's an opportunity. Yep. And speaking of the dot-com implosion, like Microsoft via a case study where we – in previous strategies, we'd held Microsoft for a very long time. That's where the valuation could help us in the dot-com bus. So Microsoft now is know, 30 times earnings. It was over 50 right, in 2000. Right. And I don't think it was a much better company then. It's a pretty good company now. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's you know great company. You have to, at some point, be willing not to hold the stock. And yes, actually, Microsoft by this point is outperformed since the peak of the cycle, but it took a long, long time for that to happen. So. Well, the, the Bulmer era was not where they really shined. New CEO seems to have done a great job over the past, uh, what is it, five years uh, Nadalia's been there for? Yeah, um, at least that, I think, at this point. Uh, we held through the, and actually added in the Balmer era. So that would be a, um, 
are taking the view that, at least in this case, turned out to be right, that is something companies can fix. If the core assets there, you know, the core network effects of everybody using their products, they're being so entrenched in IT systems uh, departments around the world, that was still there. The easiest thing almost to fix is the CEO. So if a stock's trading at 13 times earnings and has all these great characteristics and you think the CEO can change, that can be a great time to Throw invest. Throw the bum out, bring someone else in, and the rest is history. Mm -hmm. So uh, I love this quote of yours on the backwardization of risk. Quote, the expectation is that achieving higher returns requires taking more risk, but higher quality stocks have outperformed lower quality stocks by a considerable margin despite being less risky. Explain. Yeah, and that's um, that's a point that Jeremy Grantham kind of observed very long time ago and is emphasizing for a long time. And actually, Ben Inker, who's the head of our asset allocation mm -hmm. group, just wrote a, a very interesting piece on that, too. This idea that at the big picture level, stocks versus bonds, things kind of behave what you'd expect. You get more return, but there's more risk associated with sure. it. But if you look within asset classes, that hasn't been true, just empirically. Like, why is it? It's perplexing, right, that high quality companies, which have been safer, right, they do better in recessions and such, have n you've not had to pay for that with lower return. Um, and that's that was really the core of Jeremy's observation about quality stocks and why it's not just that quality is this silver bullet that just beats the market all the time. I'm sure we necessarily believe that's true. But it, it does improve your portfolio with lower risk without having to give up return. So the obvious answer is value makes a big difference within quality stocks. Is that what leads to the lower downside in a market dislocation? If you're buying it right, there's less room to fall? Right. In isolation, quality on average gives you downside protection. It certainly did in 2007-8, for example. Mm -hmm. But then it didn't in the, when the tech bubble burst. It didn't last year in 2022. Right. Then the reason for that is a lot of the quality stocks are really expensive. So the trade-off compromise or combination of value and quality is what we think gives you that best downside protection, but without having to give up too much on the upside, too. Huh. So let's dive into the details of GMO's quality strategies. In 2022, core quality and quality value outperformed the S&P 500 by a wide margin. 2022 was a, a down 19%, I think, mm -hmm. in the S&P 500. Uh, but last year, 2023, core quality and quality value slowed, but quality growth boomed. Somewhat different environment. And quality growth was where um, all the gains were, were had. Is this a purposeful style diversification within quality? H how do you think about core quality, quality value, and quality growth? Yeah, when we think about the opportunity set for us of high quality companies, there are, as you say, really different kinds of companies within that. Quality is neither growth nor value. You can find both within it. And so when we talk about quality growth or th think tech stocks, qual core quality, think defensive, Coke, consumer staples, value, think some of the more cyclical names. Um, we like the fact that there are high quality companies in all these areas, and generally we find them attractive. And we like the fact that, as you point out, they tend to work at different parts of the market cycle. And so, yes, it is deliberate that we have exposure across these. Not that, you know, if it's 1999, we're probably not going to have much quality growth. So it's not a fixed allocation. But it does give us diversification. And because we're familiar with stocks across this spectrum, it also gives us the ability to rebalance. And that's one of the things that we've been quite successful with over the last few years is not just that we hold both these kind of companies, but we've been leaning against the wind to buy the growth stocks at the end of 2022, the value stocks more recently. Just rebalancing has had a lot of value. Really interesting. You, you mentioned Ben Inker, who I know publishes pretty regularly. You publish uh, on, a, on a regular basis also. Not too long ago, you put something out, quality for the long run, a little play on Professor Siegel's stocks mm -hmm. for the long run. Tell us a little bit about the valuation discipline quality investing offers and, and why that's so important when so many stocks have had such a great run up over the past couple of quarters. Yeah, you know, I think that's maybe a mistake I've made in my, my career has been too rooted in looking at what did well over the last few quarters. And if a stock did really well, thinking, oh, it must be expensive, whereas the reality of it, markets are efficient enough that the vast majority of outperformance is driven by truly improved fundamental results. So uh, we have to be 
with that level of humility, I think the other thing to think about is that if you're a long-term investor, getting the valuation exactly right matters less. You know, they finessing the entry exit point is less important if you're going to hold for five plus years, which is kind of what our ambition is to do with our stocks. But in extremis, which is the Microsoft in the 2000 mm-hmm. example, um, and maybe some other AI related stocks today, it really does matter. You really like the long time where you have to hold to make up that valuation uh, hole is so long that you just really shouldn't be involved. It's kind of our and, basic and philosophy. Another research piece you put out I found kind of intriguing quality investing for greed and fear. Explain mm-hmm. that. I mean, the fear part is kind of what we've been talking about. Like, if you're worried about market downturns, quality is a good sleep at night investment. The only thing I laugh about is every time we think about writing an annual letter or something like that, someone wants to write. In these uncertain times that we're now in today, it's like, when when has that not ever been the case, right? right. So people are always (laughs) worried. And so quality is always good for for that constituency. The only thing I'd say is, if, when those worries come to pass, if you hold quality stocks that you really believe in, you're less likely to sell at the wrong moment. So there's that psychological advantage to them that goes beyond just statistical analysis of return periods over time. And the greed is the quality is not just a defensive portfolio. If the end of the market's going down, you hold cash, right? You don't hold high quality stocks. So the greed part is that high quality companies do participate in the up market. And so if you think you know, AI is a great thing, if you think GLP-1s are fantastic, if you think there's innovation going on all around the world and you want to participate in it, we think high quality companies are a great way to do that. I have a, a recollection, I think it was The Onion, our long national nightmare of peace and prosperity is finally <laughs> over, was a 2000 headline. And it's true, how often, uh, how often can you say, well, thank goodness we live in times where there's no uncertainty, and, and, and everything is rational. When we say that, run for the hills. That, that's exactly right. GMO has released last quarter their first retail product, an ETF. I love the symbol, QLTY. Let, let's talk a little bit about the ETF and the thinking behind it. GMO has almost exclusively had institutional investors, um, very high net worth family offices, I mentioned um, the quality mutual fund. That's a $5 million minimum. What was the thinking behind, hey, let's do an ETF that anyone could buy for 50 bips, no minimum? Yeah, you're exactly right. GMO has been an institutional in, um, manager. We started in the endowments and foundation space and have gone from then. But as you also said, institutional includes increasingly family offices and wealthy individuals who pay taxes. And so just structurally, the ETF is such a better vehicle to yes. pool clients. And GMO has always been an advocate of pooled investing. You get the, we think, as good a solution and it allows more portfolio manager focus, not to have separate accounts. And so really the launch, the genesis of having an ETF for us was less about entering the retail market or accessing different clients and more about better servicing the institutional taxpaying clients. That said, we have a lot of respect for individual investors. I think they get a bum rap um, among institutional managers. Individual investors can be very sophisticated, discerning, thoughtful, and it's not a segment of the market we want to shy away from other than just the operational complexity of having lots of small clients. And there, um, the ETF market has matured to a point where we don't really face that complexity. And so we're glad to be able to be a lot more accessible. The only thing I'd say about ETFs, and they've been on our radar screen for a while, of course, but in Originally, they were for no particular reason, but kind of associated with passive or more commoditized quantitative factor strategies. It's really over the last few years that an active strategy in an ETF has been something people would pay any attention to. So I mentioned previously the GMO Quality Mutual Fund, um, top 1% of its peers, 13.6% a year for the past decade. How does the quality ETF strategy differ from the mutual fund strategy? Not very much. It's the same investment process, philosophy, team, and everything. Uh, the one simplification we've made for the ETF is it only in, we only invest in U.S. companies. So the quality uh, fund is global in its opportunity set, has had up to 20% in non-U.S. domiciled multinationals, think like the Nestle's of the world, that kind right. of company, whereas the ETF is designed to be a more straightforward S&P 500 U.S.-only equity 
uh, strategy. And it's concentrated, 35 large cap stocks. Is it limited to what's in the S&P 500 or is it any U.S. stock? It's not limited to the S&P 500. What we'd like tends to be large cap established right. great businesses. So uh, I think it is, in fact, all stocks that are in the S&P 500. And, and 50 bips is not an unreasonable fee structure for an actively managed fund. Tell us the thinking behind this. Why go, I wouldn't call it uh, low cost, but it's not a high cost ETF. Some of the other active ETFs or 100 bips or more, what was the thinking there? Uh, well, we're pricing it similarly to how we price our institutional um, accounts. As I mentioned, a lot of our, I think, initial funds have come from tax-paying investment advisors and such who might have a choice which to use. We wanted to make that a not fee-driven choice, right. but just picking the right vehicle. Um, another reason why we can keep the costs low is these are very liquid stocks. There's not really a capacity constraint around right. these. So it's not like we have to charge an exceedingly high rate to be a profitable business. And, and how often do those 35 stocks turn over? Is there any hey, we're going to rebalance this once a year or once a quarter, or is it driven on whatever opportunities the quality stock team you work with decides we're going to get rid of X and replace it with Yeah, there's no calendar to it. It's driven by the opportunities as we see them. If we think about the mutual fund, and I don't think this would be any different here, uh, we've been running turnover about 20% a Mm -hmm. year for the last few years, which consistent with my remarks earlier, when we buy a company, we're thinking about holding it for quite some time. In fact, probably about half that turnover is not so much new stocks entering or stocks exiting as more rebalancing around valuation moves in the portfolio. I love the ticker, QLTY. It's amazing that was even available this late in the ETF world. How did you guys start first thinking about, we have clients paying all this phantom tax on the mutual fund side. ETFs really seem to be much more efficient from a tax perspective. Tell us a little bit about the the discussions that led up to let's uh, create an ETF. I'm acutely aware of the tax <laughs> issues as I put the bulk of my investing in our, our own strategies too, including the mutual fund. Um, now, now I'm invested in the ETF. I think it would go back to over a decade. Like we were well aware of ETFs for a very, very long time. And while we got the best ticker out there, there are other quality ETFs out there, which you know, advisors were talking to us as competitors. So we were kind of looking at the competitive landscape and seeing, hey, what do they do that's different from what we do? Why do we think our approach is better? You know, we're more fundamental. We have the valuation, et cetera. There are a lot of differences. Felt like now was the time, I think, largely because of the rise of active ETFs versus pure passive ones. Now, now this obviously isn't the exact same holdings as the quality funds, mutual fund, but I'm going to assume they'll track pretty closely over time. It's the same process. It's some of the favorite ideas from quality go into the ETF. Can, can we expect similar performance from, from this? Yeah, my, my expectation is they won't differ. As you said, we've never held more than 20% in uh, non-U.S. stocks and all the non-U.S. All the U.S. stocks we hold in the fund, we also hold in the in the ETF at similar weights. Uh, there are a couple new names, so it's not just a carve-out, but it's very, very similar in characteristics. Huh. So, so I know GMO has a variety of offerings. You do equities, alts, fixed income. How does the quality screen work with other asset classes besides equities? Can you do that with alts? Can you do that with fixed income? Or is it just specific to value stock investing? Focusing on quality characteristics as well as valuation and sort of quality at a reasonable price, sort of big picture, is an idea that cuts pretty much across all of GMO's strategies and the different asset classes in which we invest. Of course, it means different things if you're running a merger ARB strategy right. with a short horizon than long-term buy and hold investing like what we do. Um, but that's that's there. Um, another thing to think about that sort of unites GMO as a firm is that a lot of our clients come sort of through the door, if you will, in our multi-asset class solutions. We, we call asset allocation at GMO. So a lot of the strategies that we've developed over the years at GMO, including originally the quality strategy, derive from 
us, Jeremy and team, Ben Inker and others, seeing a top-down opportunity in the market, us forming a strategy, if that's a conventional asset class or at the time a new asset or sub-asset class like quality investing, that's how a lot of what we do gets started. It's why we kind of have a complicated lineup for a firm Mm -hmm. our size. Um, But that does impose a certain, I think, intellectual consistency on how we think about the world. So, So given the success of this first ETF and given this expertise, in all these different areas, the obvious question is, what's the next ETF that's going to come out of GMO? Or are you guys good with quality and you're not looking for any other retail products? Well, I'm not going to break news on your (laughs) podcast, but uh, I think we do one with the idea, certainly, that uh, we might do more. If this continues to be successful, all these other asset classes that GMO plays in uh, some of them are really ripe for an ETF. Yeah, some, some more ripe than others, but I think there's a lot of opportunity out there. Maybe another way of asking that question is, why did we start with this one? I think there are, there are a couple obvious reasons. One, it is our largest strategy, but another, it is U.S. equities, which are kind of the simplest, most liquid asset class. They fit well for the transparency of an ETF structure. It's most easiest to do the market making around them. So it was a very obvious place for us to start. So the mutual fund is about $8 billion or so. Is there any limitation on how big the CTF can get? I mean, assuming it's all large cap U.S. stocks, doesn't seem like there are a lot of constraints on how large this can scale. Yeah, not practical constraints. Of course, there is a constraint for everything, but we'd be talking about tens of billions of dollars where capacity would be. Huh, really interesting. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on in, in value today. I, I, I'm impressed by this quote of yours and really curious if it's still true. U.S. deep value stocks are unusually cheap. In the U.S. market in particular, the cheapest 20% look cheaper than they ever have in 98% of the time through history. That's really surprising. I keep hearing about how expensive stocks are. The bottom quintile of value is as cheap, essentially, as it ever gets. Yeah, that's a quote that's coming out from our asset allocation team about how they think about positioning equity portfolios. To be maybe <laughs> nuanced about that, what we're talking about is the valuation of that relative to the overall market. Uh-huh. So it's kind of two sides of the same coin. It's not so much that cheap stocks are really, really cheap. It's that the spread of valuation ratios is very wide. So the non-value um, stocks are very expensive. Yeah. And frankly, I think that is where most of the action is. It's mm-hmm. that the non-value stocks are trading at much higher multiples than they normally have. And when we say deep value, it's almost like, you know, two people talk about indexes, they divide the world 50-50. That's, right. There's no magic to that. I think right now, just in a market cap sense, market concentration, there are a lot more growth stocks. So to find the true value stocks, I'm making air quotes, you kind of have to go a little bit deeper into the percentiles of market cap than you would typically. And when we're talking about value, you're still discussing with the quality overlay. So you yeah. could have quality stocks and, and the least expensive quality stocks on a valuation basis. Yes. Yeah, Um, relatively attractive, but maybe not absolutely attractive. I I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, I um, maybe apologize for confusing terminology on our part, because when we say deep value, I think people often think just the lowest price to book stocks out there. Right. And in the GMO terminology, that's deep value on a measure of what we'd call intrinsic value that blends a hefty ver- version of quality into that. So, you know, that will include some stocks we hold in the quality. I you know, think huh. the metas of the world, companies like that. We've- gotcha. So I get the sense you guys don't pay a whole lot of attention to the macro economy or geopolitics or what the Fed's doing. How how important are these other aspects to the way you manage assets? Not that important. I think the thought experiment for us is if this is something that feels cyclical, that isn't going to affect where the world's going to be five years from now, then we're only going to pay attention to it to the extent that if something happens, we react to it. Like it can create a dislocation, right? People might overreact to an interest rate move in our opinion, but we're not going to try to forecast it or pick stocks based on that. Um, You did mention geopolitics in that list. Geopolitics is in my mind a little bit different. And the reason that's a little bit different is I'm not sure that's going to be solved five years from now, right? That could get worse, or the trends that we're on are different from where we've been in the last 20 or 30 years. So that is, uh, say, of those things, the one where we scratch our head a little bit more. Not that I'm going to claim we have the answers there, but it is front of mind for us. How, How do you think about interest rate risk or inflation or the whole transitory versus sticky debate? Does that become a key part of the 
asset allocation discussion, or is it just kind of background noise that everybody has to deal with? More background noise. GMO is kind of famous for doing seven-year forecasts. Right. And the reasons we do seven-year forecasts is that's sort of the horizon where we feel like whatever the noise is that's going on now, that, that'll kind of all be gone. So the philosophy behind those is, eh, seven years from now, things will be kind of normal. And I'm not sure what the path is to get there. But if that's where they're going, this is what that would imply about returns over that horizon. And, and one of your recent notes, you, you mentioned Jeremy Grantham's super bubble thesis how do you work in quality as a core equity allocation uh, within the concept that, hey, maybe there's a super bubble going on out there? Is that, is that mm-hmm. consistent? Yeah, I'm a, a humble portfolio manager who works from the bottom up. So I'm not really thinking about super bubbles very much, honestly. I'm thinking about are these stocks that we're investing in good quality business price to deliver a good return? And good, I mean sort of double-digit type return over the next five-ish years. So if it turns out this is a super bubble, and I think Jeremy's technical definition of that is a very, very big bubble, um, (laughs) then um, quality stocks are going to go down. We'll have been wrong to invest in them. Uh, The silver lining is at least we'll have done better than pretty much anything else out there. The quality will go down less than Mm -hmm. than the rest of the uh, Mm -hmm. indices. Uh, Particularly quality with a sense of valuation. All right. So let me jump to my favorite questions that I ask all of my guests, starting with, uh, what have you been streaming these days? What's been keeping you entertained, either video or audio? <laughs> well, I have a 12-year-old daughter, and she runs the family with an iron fist. And <laughs> she likes to still watch TV together. So I've been watching a lot of Survivor episodes, uh, though. Unfortunately, I actually like those. She's moving on to something else now that I like less well, but I won't call it out. Um, in terms of, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts, too. That's where I get a little more sort of... Um, I'm sort of embarrassed to say this, but professionally takes a little bit of the place of reading. I I love Econ Talk, which is sort of a theoretical Mm -hmm. economics uh, debate podcast. Uh, For fun, I love Judge John Hodgman. Uh, There's all kinds of things out there. It's a great world. Yeah, no, it really is. So let's talk a little bit about your career. Who who were your early mentors who helped shape the path you've taken professionally? I think in my case, a lot of the mentors come through kind of my academic career and teachers and, and professors going back in my high, high school math teacher, uh, Mr. Hyde. He was the one who taught the computer programming course. He's the one who sort of encouraged me to take college courses when I was in high school. He also taught me bridge, which is I don't really <laughs> play that much anymore, but it is a great game. And let you think a lot of things in a, in a great way. Um, my PhD advisor at Harvard, Les Valiant. I'd also pick out, I mentioned Chris Darnell at GMO. Mm-hmm. Rob Soucy was the name of my first manager there. He was a very wise, wise man. Uh, if I think about one of the things I've gained from these people too, particularly the professional ones, it's kind of when to be willing to say no to stuff too. Mm -hmm. My my colleagues now wouldn't believe it, but I used to be like probably over accommodating and uh, maybe I've learned that lesson a bit, overlearned it. What are some of your favorite books? What are you reading currently? Uh, Well, this is the holiday time. Uh, I just came back from a long plane flight and I read this really fun uh, detective book that my wife gave me for Christmas. But then I was reading a biography of Samuel Sewell, who's one of the... uh, judges at the Salem witch trials, actually, so a colonial era figure. It's an interesting book to learn about that era. My favorite book of all time, and it's not even close, is a children's book called The Land of Green Ginger, uh, which is written by the screenwriter of the original Wizard of Oz movies. It is a satirical, clever take on the kind of the postscript to the Aladdin uh, myth from the Arabian Nights. And um, I I recommend all of your listeners, if they can find it, which is easy, read that book. Huh, really interesting. What sort of advice would you give to a recent college grad interested in a career in investment and finance? So investment finance is actually a very broad area. So mm-hmm. the first advice is kind of narrow that down. And the best way to narrow it down is to get exposure to lots of different things. Um, and I think the best way to enable yourself to get exposure is is don't focus so much on finance and investing. Just figure out about learning. Learn all sorts of things. Learn math. Learn history. You can always learn a trade after that. Don't think, oh, I'm interested in finance, so I'm just going to spend all my time listening to investment podcasts. No offense. <laughs> or or uh, learning taken. how to read 10Ks. I, I, don't, I don't imagine that anyone's going to listen to a couple of dozen podcasts and suddenly 
begin to outperform uh, the benchmark, it's a little more nuanced than that, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I think all the great investors talk about reading and how much they, of their time they spend reading and just learning. And I think that is one of the things I like about the investment industry is you just spend so much of your time just learning about how businesses work, how the world works. You're kind of an observer. You're kind of a miserable critic rather than an actual creator of value, but an analyzer of others' work. It's it's almost academic adjacent, given how much reading there is. And our final question, what do you know about the world of investing today you wish you knew 30 years or so ago when you were first getting started? That appreciation of quality businesses and the value to pay for them. I come, my mindset is a little bit more contrarian, and I think I, from an investing perspective, that manifests itself much more in a, a value orientation, or value meaning low multiple underperforming stocks, cigar butt of philosophy. And I think realizing the value of time and compounding and, you know, just, it's just worth paying up for a higher quality business. To say the very least. Thank you, Tom, for being so generous with your time. We have been speaking with Tom Hancock, head of the Focus Equity team at GMO. If you enjoy this conversation, well, check out any of the previous 500 Uh, interviews we've conducted over the past nine years. You can find those at iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Sign up for my daily reading list at Ritholtz.com. Follow me on Twitter at Ritholtz. I would be remiss if I did not thank the crack team who helps us put these conversations together each week. My audio engineer is Kaylee Laparo. Atika Valbrun is my project manager. Sean Russo is my head of research. Anna Luke is our producer. I'm Barry Ritholtz. You've been listening to Masters in Business on Bloomberg Radio.